is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Pat, for the opportunity to um, speak about the importance of mobilizing um, local public health system partners to improve community health, um, and also to share about um, how Fairfax has tried to accomplish this um, process. So before I get started, though, unlike Pat, I'm going to ask for a show of hands for people here who have participated or are participating in their jurisdiction's community improvement plan, MAP, partnership, all those things. Okay, great. Great. Um, great for two reasons. I'm sorry. Um, first, it means that you actually are part of, of the solution. And second, because it means that you are familiar with, um, how do I do this? You're familiar with this um, slide, which happens to be my all-time favorite slide for people, for the people who know me. And um, just to set the record straight, it is my favorite slide, not because the um, local public health systems are represented by what look like jelly beans. Although it is a very, it is one of the reasons. Um, but besides that, um, the reason I love this slide so much is um, because as busy as it is, um, it actually conveys a strong visual of what um, the ideal local public health system um, should look like. And, um, and it, is also, it also conveys an important message that you know, health is not just the responsibility of the health department or the medical establishment, as, as you have heard, um, but that it is a shared responsibility of, of many entities and organizations um, and, and interests within our community. And as our understanding of health um, continues to evolve, and it increasingly is evident that um, much of what influences health outside, um, happens outside of, of a doctor's office or, or a clinic, um, but rather has to do more with what happens in our, in our, in our communities. Um, and it's about you know, people feeling safe and connected in their homes and their environment, um, having the social supports, education, and so forth, that it is important that, that the drivers of these social determinants of health um, understand how these socioeconomic and environmental um, conditions in which people uh, are born or, or work or, or live and play and actually age um, can affect health, how these determinants affect um, functioning, um, the quality of life and risks and so on. And, and that's what this health impact pyramid is showing. It's sort of similar to to what um, Dr. Wolf showed, but a little differently. Um, this, this health impact um, pyramids, as you can see, at each level of, of the, at each tier of this pyramid are public health interventions. And as you see, the impact of these interventions actually de increase as you go down. And um, guess what's at the bottom of the, of, the, of the pyramid? The social determinants of health. And um, as you can see, they have a profound, a much more profound impact on health as compared to, let's say, the top part of the uh, pyramid, which um, concentrates, which basically deals about individual, um, um, which are basically to help individuals. And that's not to say that, you know, individual responsibility or, or access to health care and all that um, is not important it is an important determinant of health. However, it is not, the impact is not as much because of, its, of the dependence on long-term individual behavior change, which all of us um, can attest to as being very difficult because it has to be sustained. And if you're like me, I make resolutions every Monday morning to do something better, not eat this food or do the other thing, and by Wednesday I've fallen off the track, and then I say, well, 
the, the, the week has already been ruined, so let's start again next, next Monday, and that kind of. A, um, so even when we know better, um, we, don't, we don't do the right thing. And um, for a long time, we have been operating as if um, the health impact pyramid really ended after the first three um, tiers. And we have placed increasing emphasis on health education and counseling and so on, which are all good, um, don't get me wrong. But then what happens when we experience patients who are not being successful, um, like a workman with only one tool, which is a hammer. We, we hit that hammer harder the next time we see them. Um, sometimes even wanting to pry their, their brains open to say, you got to quit smoking, you got to do this, you got to do that. Well, that is, that is easier said than done because they have to go back into their environment, um, as, as you've heard. And um, so a, a person who, who's counseled about these healthy behaviors is more likely to be successful if they have other choices. For example, if you're telling someone to eat healthy and, and exercise, they're more apt to be su successful if um, the only choices they have is not just fast food restaurants or if wanting, having to go to, um, to a park um, to play or to take a walk um, actually um, increases their risk for premature death or something like that. And um, so the context in which people live um, has to be changed um, in, in order to create these healthier um, um, defaults that people can then exercise um, healthy behaviors. And um, the, the, um, the important thing about this slide is that in order for us to actually address the bottom half of this pyramid requires that we engage our non-health sector partners. All of us here um, that are engaged in health improvement pro programs um, within our jurisdictions have as part of our strategies, strategies to, to address, um, that include addressing the, the latter half of the pyramid. But it requires that we, but we can't do it alone, the health sector that can't do it alone, and requires that we get our non-health sector folks on board. The, uh, and that's, that, that is a challenge. That is a challenge that public health needs to facilitate um, but we are doing that. All the local health departments um, are engaged in the engagement activities. Um, and the good news is that once we are able to connect the dots, help our non-health -sect sector partners connect the dots, um, they are more willing to come to the table. But it does take work, um, but that's work that we, we cannot quit doing. And again, um, I'm back to my, to my, to my favorite slide. Um, and I have to admit, I look at it often, and I do so because it gives me a sense of where we need to be. Um, and it also serves as a reminder um, for how far we have come in just a little over a decade, where in Fairfax, for example, um, a lot of these lines were not even existent. And if there was any partnerships or connections, they were merely dotted lines at best. Um, representing, for example, the um, reporting um, requirements that we had with community providers or the informal um, relationships we had with, um, let's say, hospital infection control uh, practitioners or, or in the case of Fairfax County, the um, school health aides that we had in the schools and so on. I mean, we had presence, but that was not the level of partnership that um, we are talking about. But you know, all that changed um, in, um, with the events of um, 2001. And as bad as the um, um, terrorism events of 2001 were um, and are devastating to our, our community, if there's any silver lining for in terms of public health, um, it really um, made us um, get out of our comfort zone, out of our silos, and begin to engage um, our community partners. Um, for example, you know, when um, on 9-11, and especially with the anthrax crisis, we in Fairfax County Health Department didn't have a way of communicating with our providers. And providers were looking for, quest for answers. We didn't know how to, how to, how to do that, because we didn't have the capability. 
We um, also had to, for example, um, um, open dispensing sites to dispense antibiotics for postal workers. And very quickly, um, we realized that we, we had a challenge in meeting that surge capacity demand. And so it, it was very intuitive. We had to do something. We had to engage more. And out of that for experience was, was born the Bioterrorism Medical Action Team, for example, which is now our Medical Reserve Corps. We Im Im immediately found a way of communicating um, with our providers through, through the blast fax um, system. And um, our emergency, other emergency requirements such as our ability to um, 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 dispense antibiotics to all 1.2 county residents during a, a mass release of anthrax, for example, which is a city's readiness uh, planning. Um, our requirement to be able to um, vaccinate all 1.2 million of us within um, the, the uh, notification of the first um, smallpox case, for example, all of that made us work together with our public safety partners, with the schools, um, with um, public information, and um, that didn't end there. And then shortly after that, 2005, we were very concerned about bird flu, and that started a pandemic planning process in the, um, in, the, in the county. Again, we had to even reach further, engage our public, uh, not only the public safety and folks that we had already engaged and so on, but other um, human services county um, agency partners, um, the community at large, faith communities and so on. And um, it, that experience really was, I think, the first time that we were able to um, connect for our non-health sector partners the critical role that they play in public health emergencies. And to, to, I show this next slide to, to prove that point. In Fairfax County, an entire structure was put together um, to um, work with public health and all the local public health systems in pandemic preparedness. Um, then County, Deputy County Ex Executive um, um, Freddie Haywood, who's here, um, as well as Rob Stalter, chaired that process and um, it followed existing um, county emergency um, preparedness um, um, activities through the emergency, the EMCC, that's the thing in the, the section in the, in the yellow box there, to oversee what work groups that had been developed um, were doing. So there was a public health work group, there were nine work groups, there was a critical infrastructure work group, and even within the public health work groups, the leadership for those work groups were not always the health department. So um, again, um, talking about um, our engagement on emergency preparedness and so on, a surprise that we got as we began to you know, do that was that those connections, that the work that we were doing was actually helping us in our day-to-day -day activities. We're actually seeing improvement. So that got us to open our eyes a little wider. Um, and at the same time, we were working um, on a quality culture agenda in our agency, um, which amongst other things um, called for us to become more outcomes or results oriented as opposed to focusing on inputs. And once we started doing that, we, um, we began to apply that to um, our public health challenges that we're currently um, being faced with. You know, we'd already, at that point, we already come out of um, um, we'd already begun breaking the silos within our own agencies, um, breaking the silos within other local jurisdiction, public health um, um, agencies. And so it was not difficult to kind of expand that. We're actually enjoying that. But to address these challenges required that we think out of the box a little bit. And as you can see, we said it by peeking out of the box, um, um, which today is, is commonplace for us. And um, we have used, you know, um, um, our partners to address a number of public health challenges. I mean, we don't even think about um, addressing a challenge without looking to really see who all is out there who is best equipped to, um, to address that. You know, in the past, 
um, in public health, if we needed a carpenter, we'd grow our own carpenter. If we needed this, we'd do our own that. And it didn't make for effective work. Um, the, the part, that's what the local public health system is about. And we have tapped into them to address, um, for example, root causes that are fueling HIV um, and AIDS um, in the African American community. And um, because the root cause is uh, a result of stigma, which then um, propels denial, and then denial, which prevents people from getting tested, and people who are not tested, they are working around with HIV and from infecting others, and so on. It's a really um, a complicated um, spiral. Um, because all of that had its root in, in faith, we went to faith leaders to help us um, deal with that. And um, um, the, so they're working with us, they're leading um, community efforts on prevention and so on. They're helping us break the silence. Um, we similarly put together a multicultural advisory council, for example, to um, work with us to help us better understand the, uh, the, our diverse communities. Um, and we have worked with, for example, um, um, George Mason University um, on on, on vaccine literacy. Um, we partnered with movie theaters who are doing the same thing, who've done the same thing for us, reaching the general population, but with um, George Mason University to address the um, college age children, I shouldn't say children, college age um, uh, folks who um, happen to be wonderful spreaders of the flu, but poor takers of the vaccine. And um, again, we ha um, shortly after that have institu re instituted a community health champions um, initiative where we have folks in the community who are trained by us to work within their own communities to uh, um, deliver public health and health promotion messaging on, on things like hand washing, respiratory etiquette, and now we've included um, TB. And so um, I could go on and on, but I hope you, you get the idea that um, as we look at public health challenges, because current public health challenges don't lend themselves to four-walled approaches, we have to be creative. We have to look at what it is that needs to be done. Um, what is the gap? Are we best equipped to address that gap? If not, who in this wonderful um, jelly bean slide um, can, can, can help us? And we have approached them and um, the results have been um, re very remarkable and rewarding. So, um, as, as I said, there, there is, a, you know, the rationale for engaging local public health system is just, is just intuitive. Um, in this culture, or in this current situation in which, um, you know, the fiscal climate um, is making us have to do more with less, building capacity through um, um, engagement has helped us in, in addressing and doing more in addressing um, public health challenges. It has also helped to promote cultural competency. And when I talk about cultural competency, I'm not just talking about cultural competency as it relates to ethnic, dealing with ethnic folks and so on. Even dealing with learning how to deal with the pastors it's a, it's a whole new culture, and we enlisted um, a, another arm of the county government, the Interfaith Liaison Office, that is very well versed with dealing with um, clergy, has the trust of the clergy to actually work with us for a while before we even approached the, the clergy. Because um, as you'll see, these are points, important points in ensuring um, um, effective partnership and maintaining um, partnerships. Um, as I said, um, working with engaging local public health system partners provides an opportunity to address um, gaps and root causes of poor health. Um, it also empowers the community to participate in their own health. Um, and anything that strengthens the um, local public health system eventually um, improves community health and is a good thing. So um, we continue to, um, to make those investments. And um, today, all of this, you know, is really um, the new normal. Um, Cross-sector collaborations at community health um, improvement 
is an expectation, so to speak, um, of public health systems at all levels, local level, fed, all the way through the, the federal level. As, and as you can see with these examples that I have given, you know, the, essential, the 10 essential public health services, for example, one of those 10 essential um, services is to mobilize community partnerships um, to identify and solve health problems. Um, strategies for improving health um, through the um, MAP process, Healthy People 2020, the National Prevention Strategy, Accreditation, um, the County Health Rankings, all of those involve and require um, uh, that partnerships um, um, are put in place. Um, again, the shift in drivers of morbidity um, and mortality as we move from, um, you know, infectious diseases being our main uh, public health challenges through um, the, the chronic disease arena, um, it just makes sense that those um, conditions don't lend themselves to um, four-walled interventions. And so shifting to a more population-based um, service delivery model um, has to be the way that we go. So on this slide, maybe I should have named it the um, Gloria Principles for Successful Partnership because this is just me sharing with you um, things over the last 10 years that have worked for us in Fairfax. And um, at the core of, at the core of, of successful partnership and strong, um, is, is a strong foundation of trust. Um, and trust um, has to be earned. Um, it can sometimes take a while um, for that to, to be built, and, but it can be facil facilitated um, by using a liaison or so, and, and so on, which is why, again, the example that I used of using the interfaith liaison group, amazing. Um, using, um, for example, into the ethnic communities, using faith leaders, I'm not sorry, using community leaders has been tremendous in giving us entry into, into those communities. Um, having staff and the outreach team that mirror the communities that we're trying to impact also has gone a long way in ensuring um, that trust. One of the things I try not to do um, is to bring partners together unless I have an idea of what role I'm going to ask of them to play um, um, because it helps then for me to articulate the next principle, I think, which is a shared goal. Um, all of us are doing our own thing, used, holding on to our jigsaw puzzle, a piece of the jigsaw puzzle, not recognizing the big picture that this jigsaw puzzle is supposed to solve. And so, um, if, and it takes homework on, my, on our part for us to know what the other, what our partners are interested in and how we can then help them to relate um, to what it is we are asking them to do, and also to give them a clear role for what they will be, will be doing. So, for example, in the HIV case with the pastors, it was articulating these are the root causes. This is what's going to turn the curve in terms of HIV transmission in the black community, and this is what you can do to help with the messaging. And uh, an important part with that is that even though the message is clear, you get the role is clear, but it fits in with what they're already doing. So asking pastors who every Sunday stand in the pulpit and preach to countless people who have access to people on Wednesday for Bible study and Thursday for this and all these other things um, to speak about HIV prevention, it doesn't, it's not out of their way. It doesn't cost them anything. We work with them given the, the talking points. It, they don't have to do anything different. It fits right in with what they are doing. Same thing with our multicultural folks. The, the things that we ask them to do, because they all have diverse backgrounds, fits in with what they're already doing. Um, and although up front it may take a little bit of time, it, it just makes for a smooth transition. Because we, when we bring folks together to, at the table for one thing, what we have ended up seeing because they, they've become a part of the health department family and want to do more, uh, address more issues in public health, is then it allows us opportunity to layer on other public health agendas. The other two things um, 
that I th have been key for us is transparency and, and, and flexibility. Um, so because I'm not a believer of using incentives to bring partners together, and the reason I'm not a believer is because usually when the incentives run out, then the partnership runs out or dies out. Um, so what, what I la like to do is to, is why that doing that background of finding what it is in it for each partner to bring that to the table so we can leverage um, existing resources. This is what the problem is. This is what you're good at. This is what we're good at. And this is how we can work together um, to actually create synergy and, and make a meaningful change. Um, and so that upfront is, is very transparent um, so people can, um, can know what they're in for upfront. Um, also looking at the mutual, mutual benefits um, is something that I like to, to share. And also to remind people about our responsibility as leaders. I mean, having that title is not just for us to sit back and relax, but it means that we have to give something to the community. The, com the community owes, we owe the community um, to at least be leaders in that, in that, in that respect. So it's not just getting folks there, but maintaining those, those um, um, partnerships. Um, building, and one of the things that helps with that is building on what already exists, um, being able to leverage existing resources, looking for opportunities for early success, and setting realistic goals, listening to the partners. Very often, people come with the agenda. I have my agenda, they come, have the agenda, and when you listen, you hear the agenda. And what I have tended to do very early on is to um, pick out a low-hanging fruit and work with them to, um, to address that. It gets them happy and folks are you know, more um, apt to, um, um, to work with you when they know it's not just a one-sided um, street. Um, scaling up gradually. Um, very, very critical. And then making capacity building and sustainability core. We cannot, for example, devote all the resources that we devoted to the HIV prevention effort uh, forever. So you build capacity. Right now, they are developing curriculum to, that is being, that's going to be used in the churches. And that will allow us to step back. And that work will continue um, indefinitely. Um, so partnership building is work. It is a lot of work but it is rewarding. Um, and as we can see from this next slide, transforming public health together is with non-health sector partners is not new. If you look at infectious diseases, for example, control, infectious, control of infectious diseases, which is one of the core public health interventions um, or achievements of the 20th century, um, it is clear that um, even prior to the first use of penicillin, that there is an improvement in, um, in um, there's a de significant decrease in death rates from infectious diseases, which is attributable to clean water, sanitation, um, and that's not traditional health. That's part of the local public health system that um, made that contribution. And m moving fast forward now to recent events, there is um, return on investment in, in, in investing in, in public health partnership. And I, use, I go back to um, the events of 2001 with the anthrax situation, and then in 2009 with H1N1. We were pathetic in 2001 as we tried to um, provide antibiotics to, I, I don't think it was even more than two or 300 postal workers. You'd have thought <laughs> we were all over the place. You know, it was a very difficult situation for us. We were doing it all alone, trying to do it all alone. We, 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 we didn't engage partners because um, we, we, we didn't have many partners and so on. And you fast forward to what happened in 2009 with H1N1 when we had our entire local public health system. The county activated the emergency operations center, instituted incident command, continuity of operation plans were put in place which allowed the, fun the county to function normally, the health department to continue its normal functions as, and still be engaged. Because if you recall, public health was the only um, entity that could vaccinate at that time and still engage in this activity. We got 75,000 vaccinated. And although that's a huge number, 
It doesn't tell you the entourage of these 75,000 people. It was funny, the first clinic we had, I think we got 10,000 kids vaccinated. We had almost 40,000 pairs of feet come through. Grandma and grandpa and mom, and I mean, it was a whole slew of people coming through the government center. Um, so we, there was a lot of work involved in getting those through. But at the end of the day, 200, after 287 clinics and the um, hundred and over a thousand MRC volunteers given their time, which basically amounted to about $500,000 um, in, in, in services. That was pretty, pretty amazing. And so um, it was really nice to hear about, um, you talk about health and all policies because um, as you know, it is um, relatively new um, in this country and, and something that I've recently been introduced to, I, we, uh, there was a small team of people from Fairfax County, um, myself, the Deputy County Executive, um, Rob Stalza, our Environmental Health Manager, and um, our CTG Program Director, and, and um, Tim Sergeant, who is on our CTG le leadership team, and also a member of the Planning Commission. We went to a NHO's um, Health and All Policy Ac Academy, Leadership Academy, a few, a few weeks ago. And as you heard, um, this is an upstream approach to addressing social determinants of health. And that's what makes it exciting. Already social determinants of health is an upstream way of looking at health, but this is even higher up. Um, and so that's, what, how, that's, that's a terminology, high up. And it basically, for jurisdictions who adopt this high up approach, it's a way of systematically um, incorporating strategies that ensure that health is considered during non-health sector policy development, implementation, and evaluation. And I would like to um, end, um, so this map just shows that it, it's, it's basically working at the lower half of that, of that triangle. So in closing, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And um, although, you know, we've been doing a community needs assessment and it looks like there's much more work to be done, which there is, um, we should also remember, take time to remember that we have come a long way um, and that our desire for improving community health um, is enough to move us forward. And I say that because very often we don't, we don't think of that um, and where we've come. It could be worse, um, such as I am very accustomed to and where I've grown up, where you know, there's no local public health system and sewage and water and everything and sewage and trash and everything ends up in, um, in public drinking, in public drinking waters. The good news is that that's not for us to solve today and better still, it is Friday. So let's enjoy. Have a wonderful weekend and thank you.